Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Sombra, an award-winning artisanal mezcal handcrafted in Santiago, Matatlan, Oaxaca, Mexico. Hey, hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. It's June 15th, 2021, and I'm lucky to talk with this crew from Dogfish Head in Delaware, United States of America. Let's go around the room and introduce yourselves. Let's start with Andrew. Uh, My name is Andrew Greeley, and I am the innkeeper at the Dogfish Inn in Lewis, Delaware. All right. And Mariah? Mariah Calagione, social impact leader. All right, and Dogfish Head, and and Sam. Sam Kellogg, brewer and founder of Dogfish Head, and proud husband of Mariah Kellogg. Well, you, you guys are quite the amazing story, and uh, the last time I talked to you was five years ago, Philadelphia Craft Brewers Conference in 2016. Um, Sam, I'm, I'm very proud of you guys. Let, let's go back to the beginning, because part of this show is, is I know you have your great book coming out, uh, sometime later this year, but we're going to go back and just focus on some of your core brands. And I think we should start with 60 minute IPA because um, I, I'm, I'm drinking that. And I don't know, is anyone else drinking the 60 minute IPA? I'm drinking the 60 minute IPA right now as well. So Mariah, let's start with you. So what does the 60 minute IPA mean to you? Because is, is that what, is that what made Dogfish Head? Well, I wouldn't say that's what made Dogfish Head. We started making that a number of years in, but I will say it is probably the beer that I drink the most of on a regular basis. I like to switch it up and go across, you know, a lot of our beers, but I'd say volumetrically 60 minute is most often in my belly. Yeah. And that's just what I wanted today. And let's go to Sam. Sam, what are you drinking today? I'm having a hazy O, which is our, uh, Oat milk infused hazy IPA, so it definitely has some of the you know unexpected culinary you know influence that Dogfish is known for, but within sort of that hazy category. And, yeah, uh, so I'm loving it. Hey, great, and Andrew, what are you drinking? So I uh, I'm, I also am having a hazy O right now. I think uh, recently since this beer's come out, it's it's definitely been my go to for our Dogfish beers. Um, but I like Mariah. I think volumetrically, sixty minute is definitely one that uh, that's an old standby for me, and also one that for me is like uh, it's always like a gateway beer for me. If I got people that aren't really into the IPAs or or it's kind of venturing into craft, I always use sixty minute to lure them in, and uh, it's got a pretty good success rate. Yeah. So let's start. With, so Andrew, um, how, how did you start working with with Dogfish Head, and then? You know, take us through your story and get us up to being the innkeeper uh, in in Lewis. Um, so I actually um, I grew up in Colorado, and uh, I've always always had been into craft beer. And uh, in my former life, I was an educator. I was working at independent schools as a teacher and coach and admiss- admissions director over in Annapolis, but. Um, uh, like I said, craft beer has always been something I, I had been into and I was moving to Delaware and looking for jobs and I was kind of casting a wide net and uh, 
dog fish head had always been on my radar as just such an awesome place. So I actually interviewed as a part-time tour guide for a, a summer position and uh, took the job and kind of kept my hand in teaching for a, a year as I did that. And as Dogfish grew and my relationship with, this, with the company grew and I started working closer with Sam and Mariah, it was clear to me it was where I wanted to be. And so I came on full time as the tour and tasting room manager and uh, did that for a year and had an awesome time with that. That was actually when we, uh, we, we added a food element up in Milton at the brewery. If, uh, if folks have been there in the past, they might remember Bunyan's Lunchbox we actually have now a full-fledged kitchen up there that's pretty awesome. But when we first rolled it out, there was a food truck. And uh, at the end of my first full year there, I was actually in the tasting room and Mariah came down and said, hey, come upstairs. We want to talk to you. And uh, I got a little nervous. So I was like, all right, I wonder what this is about. So I went upstairs <laughs> in the office and uh, Sam was there, Mariah was there. And uh, this the CEO at the time, Nick Benz, was up there and they closed the curtains so I was like, all right, I don't know which way this is going. And uh, they said, this is just a conversation. And uh, they said, we were opening the hotel down in Lewis. And uh, they had been working on the renovation for uh, almost a year at that point. So it was opening in about two months from the point of that conversation. And they said, uh, you know, we've interviewed a lot of innkeepers and hotel folks, but we love what you're doing with the company. Would you be interested in running it? And I was blown away. I said, you know, the closest experience I have to running a hotel was working at a boarding school for two years. And uh, I remember Mariah <laughs> laughed. <laughs> Mariah laughed and said, well, that's more experience than we have. And then she said, when we opened our restaurant, we didn't have restaurant experience. When we opened our brewery in Milton, we didn't have brewery experience. And right now we don't have hotel experience. But Let's do it together. Let's learn together. And we think you're the right person for the job. And uh, the next day I met Sam actually on site at the hotel and he kind of walked me around and uh, sort of gave me his vision of the place of being this sort of mother nature base camp for Lewis in, in Southern Delaware. And it just, it spoke to me on so many levels. I was like, how, how can I not do this? You know, the universe threw it out there and I was like, I got to jump at this. So that's how I landed at the Dogfish Inn. We opened in 2014 and uh, we've been growing, going strong ever since. So it's wow. been an amazing experience. So Mariah or Sam, tell me about just how involved Dogfish Head has been in, in Delaware and, and in the coast and some of the, the charitable work that you guys are doing. And I think it touches on this location in Lewis as well, doesn't it, Mariah? Yeah, so um, sort of all of that community initiative work that we do falls under our umbrella of what we call beer and benevolence, um, and and all you know the, our coworkers at the brewery, our coworkers at both restaurants in Rehoboth, our coworkers at the inn, all the business entities are involved in really c making connections with community organizations and finding lots of different ways for us to give back to those organizations, whether that's, you know, financial support, product support, you know, it's just sort of brain trust support. Um, and we've, we work with, you know, well over a hundred different organizations over, you know, throughout the year, throughout Delaware and sort of the Eastern shore of Maryland. Um, and it's just become sort of our DNA um, in our DNA in terms of how we connect um, coworkers you know, whether they're born and bred in coastal Delaware, like, like I am, or if they've relocated and moved to coastal Delaware to work with Dogfish Head, we love um, connecting people and helping make sure that they know all the opportunities to get engaged with the community, because we really feel like it's a very important part of what our company can do um, in the local community, because the community is what supports us. So we feel like we have to sort of bring it back and, and close that circle there. Wow. And Mariah, I, I've been in Cape May, New Jersey in October when, when there's bird migrations, oh, but where, where, where you guys are in Delaware, uh, is, is there birding activities year round or, or in the winter, like January? There are, of course, you know, yes, it's definitely, there's bigger 
parts of the year in terms of like what like you're saying the migration time in the fall um the hawk migration you know the birds come right over from cape may and go right across cape and lopen state park um and we have a hawk watch tower there we also have uh, prime hook national wildlife refuge and bombay hook national wildlife refuge just north of us and we actually just did a big event with the american birding association at the inn um it was a whole weekend package and we had um Bird, different birding events on the water, on land. We had um, folks come in and speak to our guests. Then we also got, gave them chances to get out sort of on bikes and paddle boards and um, just explore coastal Delaware. Um, Andrew, what am I missing from the from our awesome birding weekend? Yeah, it was, uh, we, we partnered with some, with some local guys and American Birding Association and, and, and folks booked two specific weekends and uh, we had the beer release, like Mariah said, for Binocchi Lager. Uh, but there were all these different events they could access. And I know Mariah ended up on one particular birding trip um, up up in a, a state park area. There were some around Lewis. And uh, they also took uh, a boat in Lewis Harbor. And we went out and there's these large sort of breakwater walls. And uh, we went out and saw over 40 seals hanging out on those walls. So it was a pretty amazing weekend and we're still sort of working with uh, the Delmarva birding guys and the American birding association. So it's a partnership that continues, but those weekends in particular did uh, generate some funds that we put towards American birding association. So the birding scene is huge. Absolutely. It goes year round. Uh, Sometimes are better than others, but uh, that was a, that weekend in particular was awesome. That's an amazing snapshot. Now, Sam, we're going to go back to the origin Let's just because, you know, our listeners, you know, maybe they're they're under 35. Um, what was the origin of the 60 minute and, and what is continual hopping? Because I've actually never heard the story directly from you. Yeah. So, I mean, we're always looking at ways to pioneer uh, new concepts in the brewing world versus being sort of the fast follower model, you know, to the to the points that Mariah and Andrew just described, we're as fearless with, you know, creativity today as a top 20, you know, indie craft brand as we were when we were literally the smallest craft brewery in America 26 years ago. Um, in fact, the beer they referenced with the birds, was we actually, Brian Selders, our pub brewer, made that called Binocchio Lager, and it actually incorporates edible bird seeds into the recipe. So cool. we've... Uh, We've not, uh, you know, stopped letting our, our freak flag fly as we we grow. Sixty minute was a chance to say, okay, yeah, we're a culinary oriented brewery, but it doesn't just mean we use culinary ingredients. We can sometimes use uh, culinary techniques. So I, I watched a show where a chef talked about adding cracked pepper in tiny doses the whole time a, a soup simmered. I borrowed that concept and we MacGyvered this old school vibrating football game with a pelletized hot bucket over it, strap the whole unit together, put it over our brewery and let her rip and basically kind of invented this concept of continual hopping, which makes every beer that's continually hopped, whether it's 60, 90 or 120 minute, super rich in its hop expression, but have no lingering bitterness. And we're proud to say that that original vibrating football game is now in the permanent collection of the Smithsonian. So it's really really a unique innovation that that you can taste what it delivers to the beer and is is kind of a a central, uh, you know, component to our off-centered stance. You know, and Mariah, you you were drinking 60-minute IPA, and that's what I'm drinking too. It does remind me of like a lot of times when, you know, there's so much going on, so many new beers, but a lot of people will say, what are you drinking? And they're like, well, I'm actually drinking like a Sierra Nevada pale ale. Yeah, you got to go to your standby, right? Everybody has one of those. (laughs) 60 minutes, mine too. (laughs) But what about me? I thought I was your standby. (laughs) Well, not in liquid form. Ah. (laughs) <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going to let you guys go wild in a few minutes, but um, I, I want to get to the um, we we had the launch of the Hazio, and and I really got I like that. So, what was the connection with the oat milk? Um, how did that come about? Because you know why why oat milk and the Hazio, and why yeah. is it so good? Because I I, I I still keep drinking it. Nice. I like hearing that, Jimmy. And I'll just say, so oats, that, that, so when I say we like to pioneer, we did not pioneer 
putting oats into IPAs or certainly beers with the oat milk, uh, oatmeal stout style that's been around forever. But we did our first like hazy, you know, un- unfiltered IPA about I don't know, 12 or 15 years ago with Squall. Um, and we used out oats in that format, as do many, you know, modern hazy IPA brewers. The big point of differentiation for us is the oat milk. So I was at a coffee shop in Philly, some hipster barista, when I tried to order a cappuccino with <laughs> milk was like, oh, dude, you got to try it with oat milk. It's so silky and smooth. And, and, I, and I said, all right, buddy, whatever you say. And I tried it. And like literally as I'm sipping it, I was Googling oat milk sources because it was notably uh, more rich and, and silky and smooth. And that got me in touch with the folks at Elmhurst, a 100-plus-year-old family-owned company that has converted all their dairy production to nut milk uh, production and – yeah, I just said nut milk on your show, Jimmy. Uh, and <laughs> we did some trialing of the recipe, and we fell in love with it. With the oat milk, gives it a really uh, sm- like silky, soft m- mouth feel. So even though Hazy O's uh, a little over seven ABV, it really drinks as like a session IPA. It still has all the really beautiful tropical, juicy notes that other IPAs share, but it's got such a distinct. Uh, soft, silky mouthfeel. Andrew, you're drinking it too. What would you add to that? Yeah, I I love it. I love it. And uh, um, I know, you know, the hazy, the hazy categories everywhere and, and people get to bars and they're, they're just like, give me hazy, juicy, hazy, juicy. And, and they're good. And uh, this one in particular, I just, I love, I love ours. I, it's, it's one that I keep coming back to. Um, I've got uh, my brothers in the Marine Corps and, and, and he's just this diehard IPA. We always talk about being beer geeks and beer Jedis, right? Don't don't <laughs> don't make people feel stupid for what they don't know about beer. Show them the way, right? Like teach them about it. Teach them why it's it, it's good. Why why to support independent craft beer? Um, my brother and his Marine buddies they may not be the same way, but they love these hazy juicy ipas and this one uh they love this one too so it's 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 crossing all all boundaries <laughs> well sam you just said you said nut milk on the air well don't worry we're i'm about five years behind from my 18 year old daughter says daddy uh you're about five years behind coffee bars so um <laughs> but actually just it's it's off topic but elmhurst so you're saying that i know that longtime dairy from new york area you, yep. they converted all their production to nut based whatever dairy or not yeah, based well, yeah yeah beverages <laughs> and uh, yeah yeah so i mean the, kudos to them uh, on making such a bold move with their own entrepreneurial uh business but uh they were prescient you know when they did cuz you know uh specifically oat milk is one of the fastest growing just consumer goods out there when starbucks started leaning into it uh, at the beginning of this year Pete, consumers loved it so much that Starbucks ran out of it. And I'm proud to say we secured enough volume of it that we've not run out of it with Hazy O and people are really digging it. Yeah. Now, for, for you as a, you know, a, a business growing, um, I'm sure there were a lot of challenges and including things like, you know, keeping up with supply. Um, do you want to tell me about what, was there one time when you had like you were out of hops or some other ingredient and you had to improvise. And this could, this could be way back years ago. I, I, I kind of want to hear about some of the early stories. Well, yeah. I mean, one, one that comes immediately to mind is back when poor Mariah was at the, the screen of her computer when we were on Peachtree uh, Home Software running the brewery. And we had this one guy, Mark from LD Carlson, who called us every week to try to get us all the money he owed and, we tried to ignore the phone calls until he wouldn't send us anything. And one week they didn't <laughs> send us glue uh, for us to run our labeling machine or our bottling line. And we ran all these bottles and we had to g- deliver beer to make payroll. So we literally rubber banded the labels to every bottle <laughs> and brought them to the distributor. So if anyone out there is listening has a rubber banded bottle of Squall or Midas Touch, uh, you, have a, you have a collector's item there. Yeah. And and Mariah, did you want to say anything about those early days and just like the hard work that you guys did and ingenuity? Well, I got really good at disguising my voice when when Mark and his his peers would call looking for their 
um, the money that we owed them. <laughs> I would say, Mariah, no, she's not here. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that was, I mean, but it was also fun. We were, you know, doing whatever it took to, to get things done, learning a lot of new things. Like when I came on full time, the, the thinking was, yeah, I'll come on, I'll do marketing. And I think for the first five years, I did pretty much everything but marketing. I learned how to do TTB reporting and accounting and payroll and manage insurance and, you know, all the things that I had no idea about. But we learned on the fly. And, um, uh, you know, and then it was even more awesome when we were able to get to the point where we could hire people who really knew how to do all those very important things. Um, But we had a lot of fun. Even though what, what was one job in the crazy. early day that you what was one job in the early day that you that you were doing that you were hap- so happy to hand off to someone else? Oh, anything to do with HR, because I would do it and then I would attend these like one day HR seminars just to try to learn more about what I was doing. And they would scare the crap out of me, like all the ways I could screw everything up and mess up payroll and be liable for crazy things. And so I was happy to hand off that, um, as soon as I possibly could. (laughs) And both times I would add that when I was pregnant with each of our kids, my biggest concern was that I wouldn't go into labor on a payroll Tuesday because I was the only person at the company that could do payroll. So that was kind of stressful. I can hear you (laughs) on that one. And, and to jump to, to the present, you know, there's been so much conversation about a lot of, a lot of as like young, you know, happen in small craft breweries, you know, the issues that have been talked about recently about, about women in the industry. I feel like part of that is that they're growing so fast that they don't have that HR culture, right? You think that, Mm -hmm. you think that's a big issue for growing businesses? Absolutely. You know, when you're small and you're, you're sort of just doing everything you can just to keep the beer going out the door and the customers coming in the door, you know, sometimes you're not paying attention to what you should be paying attention to. And if you have coworkers in the building that are acting inappropriately, that exacerbates it. So not only do you have some challenges that might be brought on by your customers or your coworkers or your, you know, partners externally, when you don't have the resources to provide support for your coworkers um, internally, it just makes it more of a challenge. And so I think as you've seen um, the last couple of weeks, as a lot of stories have come to the fore, a lot of them are not just, hey, this happened to me, but hey, this happened to me. And when I brought it to people's attention, it wasn't taken seriously or it wasn't reacted to. And I think that in itself is like a double whammy. And I think a lot of companies and breweries of all sizes are learning from that. And so it's an amazing, a sad, but amazing learning opportunity for a lot of a lot of breweries and a lot of businesses. And for you guys, I mean, 25 years, it's, it's amazing just that you've grown in so many ways, and but also kept this culture alive. I mean, this, what is it called? Un, I know it's like obvious to most people, but un, uncentered uh, vibe. Off-centered. Off-centered, yes. yeah. <laughs> See, I said it because I wanted you to correct me. <laughs> <laughs> but to get back to it, um, okay, now the goofy question. Sam, there's an mm. ad of you like jumping on a pogo stick. Mm. Yeah. What is that yeah. about, and how long can you stay on the pogo stick? Do you, do you okay? Do you people said you need to talk more about data on podcasts? Do you measure <laughs> your pogo yeah. jumping in minutes, or do you actually count the number of pogo jumps? It's more like that old lollipop ad. I, I count the jumps that I successfully execute, and actually, as painful as that was to be po- pogo sticking for seventeen you know, uh, attempts to hit it right for an ad. I had this goofy hat on with two beers coming out of it uh, and straws to my mouth that just absolutely killed my skull. And that actually (laughs) hurt hurt me more than the pogo sticking action. (laughs) That that's pretty good, and it's on the it's on the Dogfish Head website. I I, I recommend it. But you you you've kept the goofy spirit alive, and it seems like um, you you and Mariah have have really done done well together. So hats off to that. Let's jump to Sequential because that's a new one for me. And when I was first thinking about the show, I I always think about your sour beers. I remember having Festina Pesce, um, you know, twelve years ago or so. It was like a summer mainstay. Um, 
I loved it. And I asked, asked our, our good friend, the surprise question is um, from noted beer writer and editor, Ben Keen, who we all know is a good buddy. Yeah. He said, first he says, hi, Sam. But he says, ask him if you're, if you're still bullish about the sour beer car- category, especially when you launched the Super 8 um, a few years ago. Like the Super 8, that super goes Yeah, up. yeah, yeah. So the answer, the short answer is, heck yeah, sours are growing super fast. But what's interesting, you know, being data, data driven on the, on the podcast, Jimmy, is what's cool about the sour style is it's one that's most prolific with the smallest – you know, the smaller half of the 8,000 commercial breweries in America, meaning those that operate mostly tap rooms, mostly outside the three tier system and sell the bulk of what they make direct to the consumer in their own bricks and mortar, which is just an awesome, beautiful, fresh, you know, drinking and communal experience. But what it also means is that data doesn't get counted. It doesn't get swiped on a barcode at a store somewhere. So it's really, you know, it's subjective how awesome the the sour category is because from a data perspective, you can't track it. But like you, Jimmy, any hardcore beer Jedi, to use Andrew's term that you talk to, knows that a ton of the excitement in the craft beer industry today is being driven by sours, especially like fruited sours, kettle sours. I think the, the more acidic, lower pH, you know, Belgian lambics are a little more challenging for, you know, today's, you know, uh, drinkers, uh, particularly those that want to have more than a few in a setting, but something like Sea Quench Ale that's only lightly soured and just super expressive of that citrusy, refreshing experience uh, is 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 exactly in the sweet sweet and sour spot of where people are going. Yeah, I mean, I remember it was like the summer of 2015. New York Times writer Eric Asimov did a featured article about Goza, and. Um, there weren't as many goes as then. I remember Garrett Oliver was upset because he said it was the one style that we didn't have in the Oxford Encyclopedia of Beer. And mm-hmm. Eric Asimov actually called that out. Um, but, you know, it's come so far since then. But tell us more about the sequential because I, I it's it's not specifically a style, right? It's, it's not just a goza. It, it's something yeah, it's a like, little different. Three beers brewed in sequence, three styles and then blended a, a goza, a Berliner, uh, and a Kolsch, and then we're also blending in sea salt from the mouth of the Chesapeake, sea salt from off the coast of Maine, and black limes uh, as well. But what you just said about the Goza reminds me, Andrew, weren't you on the small batch team that did a, a special Goza with Matt Barth? I did. I did. Can we you, actually – uh you hear that story with Jimmy? <laughs> so there's a – there's, there's so it's sort of a, a co-worker competition – um, where you get a team together and a brewer and um, you you come up with an idea for a beer and then you brew that beer. Uh, you do it on a small, it's a, it was a small Sabco system that was up in Milton and everyone did it. So, you know, you get folks from accounting, folks from HR and uh, they come down and brew a beer. And then once your beer was finished and ready for presenting, you would actually roll it out at beer 30. So beer 30, yeah, you know, 4.30 on Friday, all the coworkers come in and uh, taps are open for an hour and we drink beers and, and sort of talk about the week and have an awesome time. But if you have a small batch, you roll it out. So it's actually kind of intimidating because you've got people in the lab, brewers who've been doing it their whole life. They're tasting this beer you made. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's a good process. It keeps everyone engaged with what we do. And uh, and what why we're why we're there, but um, we came up with one called S Cargos that we <laughs> used uh, snails with, and uh, me and uh, a couple buddies up at the brewery had uh, had had some success in the small batch program. And there's various different awards if you win. So if you win for the quarter, your beer goes actually every quarter goes on tap down at the brew pub, uh, and then if you win for the year. Um, it, there's all sorts of good stuff that can happen, but, uh, the S car goes, we, uh, we're like, all right, this sequence is killing it. Let's, let's come up with a, uh, uh, a, a beer with snails in it. So we talked to the, we talked to the chef down at, at the pub and he let us know sort of the best snails to order. So we did. And then we brewed this beer and, uh, it tasted pretty good when uh, when it was sort of headed into fermentation, but uh, by the time it came out and got in front of all the coworkers, um, you know, it's kind of like that bad CD or record that you buy, where you're like, 
you you know, you spend about 18 bucks on it and you sit down and you listen to it and you're like, this is good. And then after about five days, you're like, this record stinks. And you kind of got to come to terms with what you've decided to do. So we're like trying to talk everyone up in, uh, in the tasting room, you know, this is a great beer, isn't it? And I just remember someone at the lab looking at me and she goes, tastes like pond water. And I was like, all right, I don't think we're winning this round. So S car goes did not fly, but it was, uh, it was worth a shot. It was inspired by sequench. <laughs> well, it's kind of like, that's the, the small batch conundrum, right? Or the homebrew yeah. conundrum where you yeah. always like your buddy's beer and then it tastes great. And then you just don't want another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it's great. Let's try something else. So, uh, but I think, uh, you know, Sequence definitely pushed that, pushed us to to try that. But I love Sequence too because it has there are so many different stories around it. But for me, I love it because uh, it's it's connected to our restaurant Chesapeake and Maine, and um, I'd love going to Chesapeake and Maine and getting a platter of oysters and having oysters on the half shell with a Sequence. It is just such a phenomenal pairing with uh, with raw oysters and uh, and. I, that's that's one thing that I love about it, and there's like Sam could go on and on about some of the stories with it. Sequench is one of the more storyful beers that we have, and uh, I think that's one of the things that makes it so unique and so easy to drink. And also, you realize how much time and effort went into it. And wow. Sam, what's the name? Like the black limes in it are really really hard to bust up. So yeah. what's the, wasn't there a process up in Milton where they had to figure it out and they landed on something long-term, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, you know, first, we used to br- break them up, like just throw them in bags and just, you know, hit the bag against the wall like monkeys. Uh, and then we started hitting the bag with wrenches, which also was an effective <laughs> so we, we MacGyvered an old uh, apple press uh, into a dishwater motor and it spit the black limes out super fast, just the way that Busta, Busta Rhymes spits out rhymes real fast. So, of course, we had to call the machine Busta Limes. <laughs> well, let me say, I know about black limes. Friends of mine at Burlap and Barrow, the spice importers, have been bringing them in. And they're, what are they? They're just like a, like a Persian or something, like yeah, dried, yeah, yeah. like shrunken dried lime, right? Yeah, and shouts to Burlap and Barrels. We, we 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 buy a lot of you know exotic, beautiful, you know sustainably har- harvested uh, free trade you know spices and stuff from them. We got great great respect for for those guys. But yeah, so black limes are basically limes that have been boiled in in salt water till there's no moisture left, and then laid out in the sun to dry, and that's what gives them their uh, pigmentation. And then they're just super intensely citrusy. Uh, uh, in, a, in a beautiful way and added a unique uh, contribution to the beer versus, you know, fresh limes and lime peel, which we use as well, but we just kind of meter both in in a ratio that we think is kind of the sweet spot of, you know, ultimate sort of refreshing experience. Oh, that's great. Hey, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes talking more with the crew from Dogfish Head on Beer Sessions Radio. This episode is brought to you by Sombra, an award-winning artisanal mezcal handcrafted in Santiago, Matatlan, Oaxaca, Mexico. Sombra owns and operates their own distillery, which ensures consistent quality, supply, and environmentally friendly production methods. Sombra is committed to sustainability, recycling distillation waste into adobe bricks to build homes for those in need. Learn more at sombramezcal.com. That's S-O-M-B-R-A mezcal. Dot com. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Check us out and become a member at heritageradionetwork.org. Sam, what's going on? Good to be back with you, Jimmy, and with Andrew and Mariah. We're drinking the beers and solving the world's problems simultaneously. <laughs> So we're, we're talking more. I, I want to talk more about the Sequench Ale because it's like Session, Kolsch, Goza, Berliner Weiss. But first, let's talk more about your culinary inspirations because with the 60-minute IPA, you saw a chef slowly putting in, you know, ground black pepper into a soup. And now, now you're talking about uh, getting these like shrunken black limes and, and incorporating them into your beer. Yeah, well, you know, we're, we've always been fearless with 
you know, incorporating culinary ingredients into our recipes, you know, sequential is one example that we're really proud of of that. But as you know, you know, and I'm going to ask Mariah and Andrew, their favorite sort of sub six ABV beers ever in our portfolio. But another one for me that falls into that wheelhouse would be Slightly Mighty, which is our sort of, our, it's the best selling locale IPA in America, Slightly Mighty. And it's uh, basically the, the breakthrough is we use these Chinese uh, extract of, of monk fruit, which has no calories, but adds like a body to the beer so that you can build all these muscular hops onto the body of the beer. So the sessionable, lower ABV, high sessionable beers are, are certainly uh, enjoying a moment in the sun, literally, as we come into the summer. And Slightly is one of my faves. I don't know, Mariah and Andrew, if you got a fave in addition to Sequence and Slightly. Of those two, you're only giving me two choices? <laughs> I said other than. Oh, other than. My favorite is Festina Pesh. That's on my list too, Mariah. Mm-hmm. It's good stuff. Uh, I, what's what's our ABV on Super 8? That counts. I'm going Super yeah. 8. I'm going Super 8 because if you got stranded on a deserted desert island, you could survive off Super 8. <laughs> well, Ben Keen was asking about the Super 8. Let, let's, let's go into that. So the Super 8 is a Super Goza. What's a Super Goza? So, uh, you know, as you know, Jimmy, the TTB, uh, you know, expects brewers to speak about the, the beverages they love to make in ways that are, you know, um, exciting, but you can't make health claims with, with beers. You know, our, our whole journey has been about weaving, you know, culinary ingredients, inspirations into traditional beer recipes that also have water, yeast, hops and barley. So we identified, you know, a bunch of super fruits. And quinoa as a grain that worked really complementary to each other in a really sessionable, really fruit forward, uh, but not too tart, uh, sour beer recipe. Um, and Super 8, we love it. It's kind of like, you know, Andrew, myself, Mariah, our, our hundreds and hundreds of coworkers love all of our children being the beverages and dishes that we make. Uh, but sometimes you got to uh, let a, let a child go away to, to summer camp for a bit and hiatus them in your portfolio. Super eight's one of those. Uh, so it's not nationally distributed anymore, but, uh, Brian Selders, our brewer in Rehoboth has a really cool program where he brings back hiatus beers that were once in wide distribution, like a Raison d'Etre or a Shelter Pale Ale or a Chicory Stout. So I do think, uh, Super eight's one that would be ripe, uh, for reinvention in our small scale, uh, canning program out of Rehoboth someday. Yeah. And then Mariah mentioned the Festina Pesha. Um, what, what is that anyways? Was that a Berliner Weiss? It was. What is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was really tasty. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to describe the Pesha. Ber- Berliner Weiss is the base style. And then with peach. But it, it, it really, you really nailed it with that one. Um, I, I remember there was one hot summer. It might have been 20... 17 or 18 I, th- I think i drank it every day for the summer um is, is that still in distribution too i don't know anything so mariah you can foreshadow in, in some well we brought it back last year in a variety pack um and we might be doing that again soon but i can't really say well you got you got things going in the sequence and then so sam you wanted to talk about the the slightly mighty locale so once again, look, first, what's the ABV on that beer? That's uh, four even. So it's, you know, it's the lowest ABV beer in our portfolio. But it, essentially, we chose that number secondarily to wanting to hit, uh, you know, 95 uh, calories. Because, you know, we got, you know, ABI, the global brewer, you know, something we take our hats off to them is what they have done with Mick Ultra in terms of wide, you know, acceptance and excitement for a beer that's only 95 calories. So we challenged ourselves with that benchmark to say, could we possibly make a full flavored, you know, IPA aromatically and taste wise, but at at 95 calories. And it took us almost a year of iterations on the recipe, but we're proud to say that we did it. So how, how important is like locale to people with like active lifestyles? Well, you know, and, and Andrew started the, the discussion about the inn is, and we we can there's a, a map over our our uh, fireplace there uh, that uh, Mariah and I, son Sammy and I painted 
many moons ago when we opened that says, welcome to Lewis, Mother Nature, let's do this. And I think generally active lifestyle, people just wanting to be outdoors, especially as we come out of COVID, you know, COVID cabin fever. It's a moment where people are just embracing the outdoors and nature for both mental and physical, uh, you know, well-being. Um, and beers like Slightly, like Sea Quench, like Hazy O with the oat milk really fit into that kind of uh, uh, pr- prioritization of uh, being out in nature and ingesting beautiful, you know, natural products while you're out there. And then do, do you ever talk about like, like we, some of us know that, you know, Guinness Stout, Irish Dry Stout is like only three and a half percent ABV, but people seem to think it has so much, it has so much flavor. Um, yeah. Have you talked about what you can get out of a low ABV beer besides locale? Yeah, and Andrew and I, you know, we often host what we call um, fireside chats at the inn, which is, you know, we have uh, all we invite all the guests from all the rooms down to the fireside. Everyone kind of BYOBs, and we just talk about uh, beer for an hour. It could be about the business of beer, beer styles, etc. And Andrew, jump in here too because those are some of my favorite uh, meetings when I'm home because uh, you really get to see what people that care enough to stay at a beer themed hotel think about all kinds of subjects around beer and beverages, et cetera. And it was definitely at that fireside, you know, we were already doing namaste and some sort of wellness, you know, oriented beer without consciously considering them through that lens uh, back then. But it was around that fireside, you know, whether it was at our dogfish dash weekend or our running race or, you know, a birding weekend or people down biking that you just got to see more and more people getting psyched about lower ABV, but high flavor, lower calorie, but high creativity uh, beers. And Andrew, what would be some others that kind of went off in multiple fireside chats that that people helped us shepherd, you know, off-centered directions towards? Well, I think, uh, you know, sort of stepping back to sequence, I think the the sour thing was for a long time was a huge conversation around the fireside chats and, and sort of uh, just as it was really coming out of the gates and, and it still is, it still definitely is Um, with, with slightly mighty and sort of thinking about, about the fireside chats. One thing that we've always, that, that Sam talked to me about when, before we even open them, we still talk about is that it's, it's the base camp the dog fishing is the base camp. It's not necessarily the venue you're coming to see. We want you to come, but we want you to get out. We want you to go to the brewery, go to the pub, go to Chesapeake, Bay, get on your bike, go ride on the bike trail, get out on the water. Um, you know, the odds of seeing a dolphin ride right up net paddle right up next to you in your kayak is, is, is more than likely. Like it's an amazing place. Then the afternoon you come back and you sit around the fire and there's no TV and everyone shares their stories and and drinks the various different beers they're drinking. Sometimes they're talking about sort of super beer geek stuff. Sometimes they're talking about the adventures they've been on that day. For Slightly Mighty, I remember when we first opened, we had Namaste, we had Festina Pesh, we had these, these other beers that were accessible. But a lot of times you'd get sort of a small core group of people that were very active and they were looking for something else. And, uh, and we weren't exactly accessing that. So they were looking for some lower ABV stuff. You can drink 90 minute all day and it'll change your day quickly. (laughs) And, uh, so how do you get something with that robust flavor into something that's 4% and, and the monk fruit did that for us, but it was the conversations with people at the end of the day where they still want that full flavored IPA. Um, but they don't, they, you know, you, you ride 15, 17 miles or you, you're hiking all day. That 90 minute could be a leg sweeper and take you out. Whereas is when you have that, when you have that slightly mighty, um, people were looking for that. And and that came up oh, time and time again. Um, so that fireside chat, it's, it's an awesome opportunity because everybody's sharing, but I think slightly sticks out to me and in the sour and sequence are definitely two that, that really came from it. Um, for, for us, that's what I remember with that. But well, I think that this summer is definitely going to be the summer outdoors for many people, and you're making Lewis uh, and Delaware sound really appealing. Mariah, I want to go back to you. Um, we talked about the importance of, of HR 
especially as as businesses grow. Um, but you've also guys have done a really great job of giving back. Do you want to talk about your again about your beer and benevolence program, but also how when and, and how you started realizing that you were giving back or were you doing it always since day one? Well, I think it's evolved, but I think from day one, you know, people would come to us and say, hey, there's this great event happening in town. Can you donate a gift card to your brew pub or, you know, can you donate some beer? And so it started like that, um, you know, 26 years ago now, um, you know, so we were participating mostly through product and um, those kind of event based initiatives. And over time it grew and we added an annual event that, um, you know, a running event that raises money for the nature conservancy every year. And it just, it grew and grew and grew. And last year we hit over a million dollars raised for the Delaware chapter of the nature conservancy, which is of course, one of the smallest chapters in the United States. So it was a pretty significant, <laughs> That's amazing. um, you know, revenue stream for them. Um, and, and like I said, now we work with hundreds of nonprofits. We focus in three areas, environment, arts, and community. Um, so this year we're doing a, a series of four beers from the brew pub that really support the, um, environment, local, very local environmental organizations. Next year, we're going to be focused on some very local arts, uh, organizations. Um, but then we're also doing things like at Chesapeake in Maine, we have a, um, cocktail for a cause program where right now, if you come into Chesapeake and Maine and order the cocktail for a cause, it supports um, a local organization called Camp Rehoboth, which is focused on supporting LGBTQ co uh, community members. It's a really active community organization in Rehoboth. And then we have in um, Milton, we just added a benevolence tap and we put one of our experimental beers on that on that tap line and anytime someone orders beer from that tap line a donation um you know or dollars from that go to a donation pool and each month we choose a different organization and we started off um with the leukemia and lymphoma society because a co-worker was doing a fundraising um push to um get money donated to that organization because of some personal connections there. And then this month it's going to Delaware pride. So we, we just find a lot of different ways to not just write a check and put it in the mail. Like we're trying to connect with organizations in a way that, um, you know, gets our coworkers and our drinkers involved and engaged. Wow. That's great. And then, Sam, a last question for you. You know, you, you guys have evolved a lot, and congratulations on, you know, you guys are doing so well. Um, we were talking about numbers. Is there a number that you track, like, in relation to distribution or thinking about the competition? Because I still can't believe just how competitive the, the, the beer landscape is right now. Yeah, I'd say the number that we track is how many, you know, beer concepts have we – you know, given birth to, regardless of if as a, at our five barrel brewery in Rehoboth, our seven barrel or hundred or two hundred or ten gallon in Milton, or our uh, ten barrel brewery now at Dogfish Miami. How many times did we go for it and release some beverage concept that had never been released by a commercial brewery? before that's what i i mostly think about and on my hour whether it's on a bike or a paddleboard in the morning that's mostly what i'm thinking about and gives me the most creative reward is to think of some fictional idea and then share it with with brewers like mark and milton or brian selders and rehoboth or paul down in miami and say hey this is what i'm thinking you know you're a much better technical brewer than i am here's the idea with some ingredient concepts rough abv let's make this come to life together. And then the, the customer really decides if that work of fiction that we turned into nonfiction should be anthologized and, and continue on. Or if it was, you know, a, a, a sort of experimental art thing that was supposed to happen once and go away. So that's mostly what we, what I, what we think about as, as a metric that, that matters to our off-centered brand. And do you think that now is – is there anything that you can do that can shock people? Because like Raison d'Etre, like what was that? Raisins. I love that beer. Um, is is it, Can you shock people now where there's just so many different styles and so many different ingredients being used? 
Geez, once I drank a beer with Andrew's spit in it, I didn't know. I don't know if there's any, <laughs> I don't know if there's any boundaries left. Andrew, Brian, what do you think? Um, I think <laughs> I'm I afraid think, to say. <laughs> I think what I've loved about about Dogfish Head and all the things that we've done is is that shock value definitely made its way in, right? Of like, I remember a friend that uh, I did that small batch with came back from Iceland and he had a beer with sheep poop in it. All right. Right. And I was like, Oh my God. Right. But then instead of shocking, we start doing things like slightly mighty, like how low ABV and big IPA can we go? It's, it's about the boundaries and that shock boundary is one that everyone sort of started to gravitate towards. And it was kind of fun to watch, some of our stuff kind of head in a different direction of saying, all right, we're pushing a boundary here, but where are some other boundaries that people aren't looking at yet? And that's what drives creativity, drives innovation. And uh, I think, you know, Sam and Mariah and their experiences that they have, and they bring it back to guys like Mark and and, and, and Brian Selders who are, who are super technical brewers. It, it, it creates this sort of, you know, synergy around it. And and that creativity is just infused throughout. So no matter what it is, I think that's what I love about it is, you know, that shock value is not there, but there's different ways to do it. Yeah. Well, then that's last thing, Andrew. Um, one reason we all came together is that there's going to be a really great book coming out sometime later this year about the 25 years of dogfish head. And Sam said that you, you are a big part of that book. Um, were, were there one or two stories that you really wanted to uh, feature or anything else you want to say about that? Just so people can start getting ready for that book. Cause I'm, I'm ready for it. <laughs> um, man, I can, I can go on and on with that question. Um, I think uh, one of the, one of the keys to, to everything that's happened in the past 25 years is, is really the community of dogfish and that we've built. And that includes our coworkers, that includes our fans and, and uh, everyone who supported us along the way. And we're constantly building that group. So I think when I look back on sort of the, our process and that we're doing with this book, um, it has to do with the stories and really from some of our coworkers and what stood out to me. Um, and we're talking earlier about, about some of the things that are happening in craft beer and some of the, you know, talking about HR and making sure everyone's being respectful. And from the beginning, Sam and Mariah have created a community and a company that is really, it's, it's family-based and there's got to be transcendent respect for everybody, no matter what. And we can still have fun, but we always, we always have to maintain that respect. And in talking with coworkers that are featured in the book, um, that's one of my favorite things is just how many coworkers surround some of the amazing things that have happened, but in interviewing some of them is how often some of those co- coworkers were bought, brought to tears and tears of joy and happiness as they sort of reflected on their time and experiences at dogfish. That's, that's something that, that I'll never forget. And you'll see those stories in, in the book, but, uh, I think, you know, the impact and the heart and soul that a lot of our coworkers have brought to the table is just absolutely amazing to me. Yeah. And Andrew, just one more back story. You said that when you were getting into beer, you wanted to work at Dogfish Head. What, what was the some one thing that, that made you want that so much? So that's a, that's a good question. Um, Having, you know, growing up in Colorado, craft beer was, was all around, right? And, and you know, we, we would go to New Belgium. We'd go to Odell's. There's a small craft brewery near me called El Rancho that's got some cool stuff. And I was always sort of – I was sort of that snob, right? I'd come out east and uh, I'd be like, ah, there's not much out here. And then <laughs> – uh, but I, I literally walked into Dogfish Head and I was like, this place is awesome. And it – the beer was amazing, but it was really about how it felt and how everyone else felt there. And so that was like the first piece where I was like, oh, my God, this place is rad. I love this place. Mostly because of how you felt when you walked in. And you could tell it was uh, 
it just had that vibe, right? And Sam's talked about in uh, in his first book that we can't define off centered because if we define it, it no longer is. It's uh, it's something we can't pin down, but it's kind of that feeling, right? You're just kind of like, oh my god, this is my tribe. These are my people. And then uh, as I as I came back and applied for a job there, I never heard back. And uh, and uh, and then I was like, all right, that's okay. So I applied again. <laughs> And uh, on that that moment, I just wrote like a ridiculous cover letter. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to apply for this job. I'm just going to be myself. And in being myself, I got a call back. And that's how I got the job. And that's what Off Centered is all about. It's about being who you are and being true to yourself. And that doesn't mean being true to what someone else defines. So that's something that really, really pulled me into it. Once I got there, I think what's really kept me here is that it's a community of lifelong learners. We are constantly trying to do new things. And I think about them putting me in a hotel, Sam and Mariah putting me in a hotel in the beach town and having no experiences. It's like, Oh my God, that's crazy. I remember one of the people in the tasting room when I came down, I was like, I'm running the hotel. He's like, you can't do that. You have to go to school for that. (laughs) And, uh, and the fact that, it's like, no, we can do anything if we put our mind to it and we do our best every day. We can do it. And if we work together, we can do it. And uh, that that's what stood out to me. So you're not the kind of manager that sits in his office all day and just does spreadsheets of schedules. <laughs> no. which, which is, I think, I think what you, you do learn in hotel management school, a lot of spreadsheets. I will say I did buy a book. I did buy a book, but yeah, yeah. I, uh, I like being on the floor. I like, I like sitting around the fire pit with Sam and guests and coworkers and hearing stories. And, and it's amazing what you get from the guests when they're there. And, uh, if you think about a restaurant or a tap room, you get two hours, three hours, maybe five hours if they're having a big, big day. But the hotel gives us two days with guests. So we really get to know them. They get to know us. Uh, but we're able to also kind of get a sense of like, all right, what, what, where else can we grow? What are some different things that we can do to, to push the envelope here? Yeah. So well, it's, it's well, cool. Last thing, we're going to wrap it up. The, the first book I, I read of yours, Sam, was from, I don't know, a long time ago. He said beer, she said wine. And I'm not going to ask you about that book, but I'd like each of you to tell me as we close off your favorite beer and food pairing, perhaps from one of the restaurants that you guys have or some other experience. Favorite beer and food pairing, start with Sam. Uh, not, I have to think of something different because Andrew took mine, which was oysters and, and <laughs> Chesapeake and Maine and Sea Quencher. That was at least one that he already said. Um, so, you know, it might be the, the freshest one I just had. So Mariah and I took our little boat here up at Dogfish Head, Maine, where we have a you know, Caledonia family has this little R&D brewery up here at our namesake location across the, the the saltwater river here to a great little restaurant and we got to have a beer called osprey a a w e you know dash spray uh uh-huh. brewed, brewed in collaboration with a little brewery here in booth bay maine uh you know with, with strawberries and local rhubarb uh and we got to have that beer uh uh actually also with raw oysters uh but at least it's a different different uh version and uh and and just like you know the way that Andrew said that the, the sort of people before products as as we sat there looking at out at Dogfish Head drinking that beer we did collaboratively thinking about the people that we brewed it with while we were having fresh oysters was an awesome experience. Wow, Mariah. Um, my favorite pairing of something that we do at the Brew Pub is we do these amazing dry rubbed grilled chicken wings and they're so good. I could eat them every single day, but I don't. Um, So I love our dry rubbed wings with either 60 minute IPA or a beer called covered in nugs, which is a brew pub exclusive that we brew um, in Rehoboth and can for sale from Rehoboth. But either of those beers with our dry rubbed wigs, wings followed by our green machine salad, which is like just, the best salad in the world. That sounds really good. And Andrew, what, one more, one more favorite food and beer pairing. So I, uh, I'm going to go to the pub 
and uh, I'm going to do a burger. And uh, the burgers we have down there, we actually work with a farmer in Maryland. It's called Rosetta Farms. And uh, the burgers themselves are actually dry aged before they actually send us the uh, the ground beef. And we do some steaks with them too and things like that. But the burgers are phenomenal. These, these guys actually spent a night at the inn and uh, Sam was there. Um, and we actually... Zach, our chef, was grilling steaks over our fire pit. This is during COVID. And we're like, I think it was for a James Beard event, wasn't it, Sam? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was and broadcast the whole James Beard network. It was phenomenal. But once I sort of realized that, I was like, why are the burgers so good at the pub? And I was like, oh, this is why. So I'm going to get the burger uh, with fries. And then I'm going to go with a blue hen pilsner, which is a, a – it's like covered in nugs. Mm-hmm. Like Mariah said, it's uh, only going to be uh, down at the pub, but it's a Pilsner. And Brian Selders is uh, – he's a Pilsner Jedi. He's pretty good at what he does. It's just phenomenal. So to get that, you got to come stay at the inn, and we'll send you <laughs> down on a bike. Shameless right. plug. Shameless <laughs> plug. There we go. Sneak it That's in there. It. <laughs> it's it's, it's going to be the summer of a night at the inn. You guys have been awesome. Thanks so much for joining me, Andrew, Sam, and Mariah. Big shout out to our engineer, Armin Spengen, and producing intern, Caroline Fox. I'm Jimmy Carboni, host of Beer Sessions Radio. We'll catch you next time. Thanks so much, guys. Woo! Do it, Sam. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Jimmy. (laughs) All right. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had Those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then, like, how how that all came to be and realize, like, wow, like, this piece of legislation, all this money, like, it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.